Welcome to chapter 14. This is the final chapter of the book and this is the last of the slides and slide sets that will be being covered in the course. Now, just because you're on last doesn't mean that you're the least important. If anything, the reason why distribution is placed at the back of the book is because you need to have made all of the decisions in the marketing mix prior to deciding how are you getting the offer that has value to the market that you want in order to facilitate the exchange. So what we're going to look at in distribution is the delivery of value proposition. This brings us back to the marketing definition, the creation, communication, delivery and exchange. So we're on delivery and exchange as a combination here. Exchange was previously brought up as part of the creation of value proposition. And here, what you're seeing is the other half, where we actually have to make the offer and make the offer happen. So effectively, what you're looking at in distribution is a set of theories, a set of ideas, and some practicality. On the theory front, one of the areas that we are, have seen a lot of work done on is the value chain concept. Now, this is, a, again, a theoretical model. It's a way of describing the world. It also has been a dominant way of thinking about how the firm exists and operates. The notion of the value chain is that we convert from raw material through to final end product over a series of steps. Each of those steps in the chain, each link, necessitates some form of transition transposition. So the supply chain, you start with the raw materials through to the manufacturing processes, through the firm's own product creation process, and then you finish from the firm's perspective. At a point, once you have created your product, you then need to move it into your supply chains so that this end product of yours can move through into the network to be put in an opportune position for a customer to access it. So we have the location of the marketer and the marketing process moves up and down the supply chain to some extent, depending on what your role is and what your business is performing. At the top end, the generic value chain. Again, as a generic model, this is a descriptor of the world. This is a way of seeing how the world can operate. It's not necessarily the perfect view of the world, for you in examining this, what you're looking for is to say, how do we tie together now this final chapter, the marketing I've learned thus far. So if we look at this from the perspective of inbound raw materials evokes business to business. The production can be in-house, can be external, in which case more business to business, it may involve services. You then move to the point of the distribution of a finished product, bringing in the distribution network. The marketing activities here are located after distribution, which indicates that the emphasis here is on the pricing and the product so, and the promotion. Whereas what you could be thinking about here is that marketing can be sitting over the top from production through distribution and into customer service. But effectively, the role of the value chain, and you will meet the value chain again in later courses, and there'll be more complicated variants of it. So just like before, where you find a model in a later course that you have encountered in intro, it's an easier adoption of that idea and adaption of that idea to the context of the new course. So when we're talking about channels and distribution, Again, in the theoretical model front, a couple of the areas we talk about is the idea of the direct and the indirect channel. This actually brings up one of the most uh, interesting arguments and ideological disputes that has ever occurred in marketing. And I'll briefly draw your attention to a later slide. That the distribution channel here, if you count the arrow, you have the first bar is a one level, direct distribution one level. If you count the box, that's a zero level, that's a one level, but if you count the arrows, that's a two level. 
And this seems to be an odd thing to be pointing out. It's that there is a huge dispute over what that to name this level, producer to consumer, whether it's zero or one level. And you're asking, why does this matter? Because then we're talking about direct channel, direct distribution, indirect distribution, levels of distribution. One or more intermediaries, what are the roles of the intermediaries? For one other aspect that should be raised at this point is that there was a lot of discussion when the internet first emerged that we would move to a perfectly direct channel mechanism. That we wouldn't have intermediaries, the internet would be the end of intermediaries uh, and brokers and wholesalers and retailers and ultimately the internet gave rise to three of the biggest intermediary indirect channels in existence and they are Google because Google is the interface between you as the consumer and the information you're seeking so it's Google actually sits up as an indirect channel it gave us eBay which is the ultimate indirect channel and it gave us Amazon where you couldn't get less direct if you tried. You're buying, you're not buying from Amazon, you're buying through Amazon, who then outsources and brokers. Particularly if you're buying secondhand or resold products through Amazon, the level of channels involved there are quite high and definitely demonstrate that the intermediary has a really good time with the internet. So let's talk about what we do with the distribution channel and why they matter. First and foremost, obviously, it's going to be the physical movement of goods from point A to point B, or more specifically, from production to consumption. The distribution channel may also alter the construction of the consumption environment. If you think about what we talked about in services marketing, we mentioned the idea of co-creation. So the distribution channel becomes this important factor on how do we co-create and how do we locate our service and our audience in the same position? So distribution can be on one side about the movement of goods. The other side, it can also be about the movement of consumers to the point of service consumption. Another area where the distribution channel functions is in the storage of goods. Now, when you look at the Kickstarter projects, and one of the things that we see quite frequently is that a Kickstarter manufacturer will someone will put up a Kickstarter and I have a particular interest and knowledge in the playing cards uh, that have been backed on Kickstarter and they will order 10,000 packets of cards who will then these cards will then go to a warehouse where they will be broken up into smaller packages if they're shipping to Australia they may actually use a second Australian agent so 10,000 cards will be 10,000 packs of cards will be run. 1,000 of those cards will then be mailed out to another intermediary who will then break that down into smaller units doing the bulk breaking. And those smaller units will be on, will be delivered on and sent on by the local intermediaries. So the individual mail outs to, through Australia Post will be conducted by an intermediary who received 1,000 packages to distribute across 1,000 different addresses in Australia. Whilst those goods are in transit, they're in stock, and they're being awaited to be sent to their users, they are the distribution channels effectively storing the product. You also have roles in distribution in terms of the communication, the support to branding, the support that a retail outlet can provide the seller of some goods through provision of information, through sales personnel, through frontline staff, through service delivery, through product demonstration. So the channel itself isn't just about moving objects, it's about moving ideas, coordinating services, and also the logistics function of how do we take these products and best get them to where our audience can potentially be. Just briefly, just want to talk about the, um, the transaction intermediary elements, which I've mentioned before. If we look at this from the point of view, what was the internet supposed to do? We were all supposed to be able to go directly to the manufacturer. That's inefficient, so the internet gave us efficiencies. Google. And there was a point in time you could actually finish reading the internet. You could see everything that there was to see on the internet. There is now no physical capacity or capability to see every piece of content that exists on the internet. There's more of it than 
can be viewed um, in terms of available time and the likelihood of the heat death of the universe. So we need transactions to be streamlined and we're using intermediaries for that. So when we're looking at it, even things like iTunes, we're not buying music necessarily directly from the recording artist. We still can, that option is there. But quite frequently we're buying through iTunes so we have an intermediary software package that sits on our desktop that enables us to buy through iTunes, through Apple, through Apple's gateways to acquire these products. So again, we talked a bit about the internet because this is one of the things that the internet as a distribution channel is a broker of services and you also have this ability to Use the internet to distribute idea products, data products, and experiences. So we can think of a YouTube video as an experience, therefore we're looking at services marketing theory, and the distribution of that experience over the internet becomes a facet where there are multiple players involved and we look at a multiple level distribution channel. So this is one of the things to consider is how are you going to move the idea of your product as well as move the product itself? Again, it's interesting to look at something like Kickstarter where the physical product is going to be moved eventually. It'll be made, constructed, printed, assembled, shipped around the world and will show up at your doorstep. But the idea of the product needs to be moved first. So we need idea adoption, pre-commitment pledging, then the product. So a couple of the key terms in here are uh, the intermediaries. The textbook is going to cover this quite well. And I will highlight that they, when we get into a bunch of different definitions, it's a technical language of marketing. Again, if this is an aspect to you that's of interest, one of the things to consider is that when you look at something like a, a key term and a term that's bolded in the text, you can run that term on Google Scholar and see what else has been said about it. So we talk about merchandise wholesalers, interme independent intermediaries, throw that, throw that into Google Scholar and see what else has been written there. If you're wanting to use these ideas in assessment tasks, look around for the key terms and search on those key terms, learn a bit more about it. In terms of channel and channel selection, one of the things to understand is that each level of channel will add a cost and that cost can impact on the price. There are also logistics elements and there are marketing communication elements. This is a facet that I'm going to raise when we have a look at the distribution levels. There is a message that is sent when you are buying directly from the producer, the consumer to the producer. We're talking about a zero level or one level. There's no gap. There's no air gap between you and the manufacturer. So you could Position this as a really high quality customized service. You could make it out to be a personalized service. It can be a, but it also can be a negative. It can be seen as a cheaper because, well, if they're only good, they'd have a retailer. And you have this challenge where if you're looking at it, say, a book, a novel, movies, music, lacking a distributor, lacking an agent and a retailer of your wares puts you back a notch of, well, if it was good, someone would have signed them. So there's perceptions of quality that come with the endorsement by you've signed with a major label or you're being distributed through a major outlet. So the first tier, the direct, con the direct connection can be both positive and negative. Again, as with most things, there's no inherent, there's no inherent good or bad in marketing. It's all about the application. Second tier that we look at here is the producer through a retailer to a consumer. What we have here is the retailer, the producer can focus the distribution or the, retail, the producer can move into handing off the distribution of the products to the retailer and the retailer's own dis internal distribution channels. The next level up on that is the wholesaler where the producer creates the items of interest puts them into the wholesaler's network, and then the wholesaler then on-sells that into the retailer's network. 
Now what happens here with wholesaler to retailer is that it's actually quite often a beneficial level that the retailers can be smaller and that the producer is dealing with a business to business transaction of one or two wholesalers, one or two relationships to manage. The wholesaler is dealing then taking on a level of risk by dealing with a multiple range of retailers. However, because they're aggregating, their ability to buy from producers is greatly improved and might improve the performance as a retailer trying to buy 100 units from a manufacturer could be nearly impossible because you're just too small. Whereas from the wholesaler, you're getting discount because you're buying in um, triple figures. So there are relationships here. Once you start throwing in additional levels of wholesalers, it's kind of tough to get a double retailer, but you can frequently get multiple wholesalers. And uh, if you take the Kickstarter cards example, the producer manufactures the card, has the cards manufactured, they are distributed to a wholesaler. That wholesaler then breaks it up and sells it on to regional wholesalers. So a US card company produces a set of cards. Those cards are printed, assembled, and combined in China. The Chinese wholesaler on sells them to a European, Australian, and American wholesaler. Those wholesalers then on sell them to the retail storefronts of game stores and uh, news agents. The consumer buys from one of those retail outlets. What's also, I think I should emphasize here is that as these lines are separated, these lines are separated for the point of understanding them. It's really likely that you would have producer-consumer direct relationship through the website, a producer-consumer retailer direct relationship uh, can exist. These multiple patterns of multiple partners in the channel, multiple wholesalers, can be routed straight or passed by the consumer going straight to the producer's website and buying outright. And you've got the existence of a whole series of intermediary brokers whose job it is is to be wholesalers so that you can order 10,000 units. If you don't need 10,000 units, you can go in on a larger bulk order and pick up 1,000 units. And things just went slightly wrong on the video there. Sorry about that. All right, the last aspect here to really sort of hone in on is to talk about, again, in terms of the, the channels, the, the re-emphasis on this, that the direct cat channel gives you a lot of control, but it also has a lot more emphasis on you have to do more of the work. You gain control in return for doing the work that the wholesaler or the retailer do for you. It's also worth noting that if, even in things like uh, textbook manufacturing and book writing and music, that you can get a retailer and you can get a wholesaler, but you are also responsible for driving demand as the manufacturer. So I write a novel, my novel gets put through an agent, the agent set on sells it to a publisher, the publisher puts it out into the marketplace. I now have to create a pull, look at a push and pull strategy of convincing customers to go and buy my book and also convincing retailers to stock my book in a level that people buying it, it's worthwhile for everyone involved. This is where the challenges and where you're using multiple layers of connections and multiple distribution strategies. It's always important to think that when we teach you these contents, we quite often show them as isolated boxes, individual parts, so you can see how they work but in reality that they are used in combination and in conjunction. All right, the, closing out the, the chapter content here, one of your questions that you always face now is that we've said we're going to distribute, we need a distribution strategy, we need a channel strategy. It's a little bit like the promotion mix, that you've got the distribution mix. And the distribution mix talks you through a set of choices. Basically, it's set your objectives. What do you want to achieve through distribution? Now, part of your objectives you can achieve in distribution are to support promotion, to support the brand, and to improve the value, perceived value. 
if you're going to be doing just-in-time delivery, if you're going to be doing home delivery, you're adding convenience, convenience improves the perceived value of the brand. If you're going to do exclusive deliveries where you're only going to be available in a very limited number of outlets, that changes the brand perception as being slightly more luxurious, harder to acquire, effort to reward ratio goes up, and people also feel greater reward for being the ones who could find the limited edition object. So again, set your objectives, look at your environmental impact, what's likely to happen in terms of internal and external, pick a strategy, and then implement and evaluate. So talking about the distribution strategies, basically there are, again, there's another one where there is a set of key terms. The text covers the um, text covers the material particularly well here. I do want to briefly talk to you about the vertical channels are uh, an important thing to be aware of because this is where disintermediation and this is where the internet did do a huge amount of damage to a traditional approach. If we take a company like Sony, and they're a big company, they owned the whole vertical music, the whole vertical marketing system. They owned the manufacturing plants that made the CDs. I'm pretty certain they probably owned the uh, whatever is required to dig the minerals and materials out of the ground to make CDs in the first place. They probably owned it that far back. But they certainly owned the CD production plants. They owned the CD printing presses. They owned the music company that was recording the music that they were selling the CDs to. They manufactured the CD players. They also manufactured the headphones and everything else that went with the music. And to top it off, most of the time, they owned the CD store that was distributing the product. So a corporate, you can set this up and it's not anti-competitive. But what you find is that as soon as somebody routes past your technology, and in Sony's case it was the emergence of the MP3 and the MP4, courtesy of Apple, these two software elements meant that if Sony was to go and quickly adopt to digital technology, hard drive based recording, and the MP3s, they would have to divest themselves of their CD manufacturing arm, their CD printing arm, their CD, CD player manufacturing arm, and they had a lot of dead weight invested that they didn't want to shed on a, best, on a new technology. So that's one of the challenges when you look at these things, saying, well, how far does the ownership go? How far does this corporation, like, just how deep does the rabbit hole go? So again, you want to look at these things from a marketer's perspective. You want to be looking at what's the most use to you, what's your best outcome. Uh, for you for, as students, again, you're being introduced to these concepts and getting a chance to see, hey, so this is how the back end of the world works. Now, the last two parts of distribution that are important to us here, intensive, selective, and exclusive are critical parts of the distribution process because these impact on the other elements of the marketing mix. Exclusive creates scarcity. Scarcity allows for increased price. Increased price in alters the perception of quality. Improving the perception of quality means that you're changing the brand's positioning. Changing the brand's positioning activates or adjusts the type of target market who would be interested. The type of target market who'd be interested then, as you're making exclusive, higher priced, more premium, you're now having to select, do you want the smaller, more focused, higher return, but smaller sales market? Do you want to start there? Can you defend that? Can you open up a second brand to pick off the larger market that will emerge after it? Because the type of market that's going to be into the exclusivity and the exclusive distribution is going to be your early adopter. And a key about your early adopter is that they are mimicked by the early majority. And the early majority is 30% of a marketplace. So they are in fact a bigger, more financial, and often 
the start of the product lifecycle growth phase. So you want to be thinking about, well, do I want exclusive? How long can I hold exclusive? And then if I'm going to hold exclusive, how do I pick up the market I have created and its second and third tiers and selective and intensive? Similarly, selective. If there's going to be multiple retailers involved, then you are going to need to be available at multiple points. That also influences what type of price, what type of retailer. The retailer you associate with will bring some of their brand's reputation to your product. Your product will bring some of its reputation to the retailer. That's why occasionally you'll see a Kmart or Target or Big W sign an apparently big name player. And we'll have Stella McCartney, Paul McCartney, you know that guy who was discovered by Kanye West, have his daughter, who's a fashion designer in, his own, in her own right, so this multi-tiered, multiple levels of celebrity endorsed product will show up in this store. And you'll be sitting there going, well, it's Tajay. It's what are you targeting in order to have this? Why are you doing this? What is what you're looking for is you're trying to give a perception of quality across the whole of the store's range. And you're trying to bring a perceived quality metric uh, from the consumer's point of view of, well, celebrity endorsed products. Yeah, that's got to be good. The question is whether people are coming there because are not going there because they think the quality is too low or they're not going there because they think the price is too low. Because the price quality combination is an important facet. Lastly, intensive distribution. This is where you are going to say you want saturation coverage. You are Coca-Cola. You want vending machines everywhere. The running theory was that Coca-Cola actually set up so that they would have a vending machine within 500 meters of an American. Uh, it's not that bad, but it was actually Coca-Cola's objective during World War II and the early post-World War II reconstructions to use the US military supply lines so that Coca-Cola products were literally only a couple of kilometers at worst away from a US air base or US military base. They then moved out to be a little more, uh, how should we say, non-militaristic in their approach to logistics, but they certainly made advantage of being able to tap into the supply lines. And that also gave them that big Americana, American brand of being associated with the US Army. Again, your distribution communicates. It sends a message, it assists the brand, it forms part of people's perceptions. If you're claiming to be the most rare, to be a product harvested from the rarest of minerals, the most exotic of locations, and you are available everywhere, no one's ever seen you out of stock at any store, your brand's not going to be consistent with uh, what people's lived experience of your product is. All right, the last part of this is basically, this is a summary wrap up of distribution. The thing I want to emphasize here is that when we are looking at distribution, marketing mix decisions impact what you do with distribution. Distribution decisions impact what you can do with the rest of the mix. Particularly, one of the things that's absolutely vital is that if you are organizing your distribution decisions, you need to see what impact that has on your product design. And again, this is one of the things that an experience that you will get from watching and monitoring the Kickstarter campaigns is the number of people whose Kickstarter product expanded. They started off with a core product. They had a, you know, they had an idea they were going to have this one base core product, and then they threw in stretch goals, and then they threw in bonus things, and then they threw in extras, and suddenly they got to the end and realized that shipping this was almost impossible. So their product decisions had a massive impact on their distribution. The flip side were the people who went out and looked at the distribution first and said, okay, we can, we can ship up to 500 grams of product. Start weighing it before we start thinking about where we're going to put extras on here. Because if it goes to 501 grams, we're paying a premium. And we might as well, if we're going to 501, we might as well go to a kilo and a half because that's the next pain point on the shipping. So you need to be thinking about, well, what does, what is 
the impact of a design decision on product going to be on distribution, what does that distribution decision then do to the perception of the product, particularly where you put up the price of distribution and distribution is high and expensive and your total price concept falls out the window because you were planning on being this uh, cheaper alternative but your distribution logistics are such that when people calculate the price plus plus postage, you're more expensive than uh, your better quality rival. So you've got to look for these things. And that closes out the semester and closes out the subject. Uh, as always, if you want to get in touch, the method's on the screen or connect to me on Twitter at Stephen Dan or send over an email, stephen.dan at anu.edu.au. And that wraps up the content for the book. With the last thing I'll say is the key to all of the marketing and all the way through is look for the crossover, look to see where it's crosswired, look to see how the parts fit together. This has been an introduction and an overview of the content of marketing. And from here, if you choose not to do marketing again, it's been great to have you on board. If you do want to go and do other marketing subjects, Remember that when you encounter this knowledge and these content items and these theories and these ideas again, that is to your benefit to see the concepts and the materials. It's not, oh no, I've learned this. It's excellent. I can build on this. So you gain a platform and you gain the ability, courtesy of innovation adoption theory, to make better use of the ideas you've seen across this course.